Much is reckoned higher than life itself by the living one, but out of the very reckoning speaketh the will to power. Thus did life once teach me, and thereby, you wisest ones, do I solve you the riddle of your hearts. Welcome to the first part of our series on the famous will to power. We will tackle this elusive Nietzschean concept in three parts. The first part will serve as an introduction of sorts. We'll go over Nietzsche's intellectual background, most importantly the influence of both Schopenhauer and Darwinism. We will also look at the question of interpretation. Is the will to power a metaphysical principle? Or is it simply a human drive or emotion? In the second part we will look at the concept of the will to power as it appears in Nietzsche's work itself. The will to power is notoriously vague as a concept, and throughout Nietzsche's writings we see how the concept comes to mean different things at different times in his intellectual development. In the second part, we trace these developments through a literature study of sorts. In the third part, we will look at a contemporary interpretation of the concept in modern philosophy. It will also serve as the grand conclusion of this series. We'll see how the will to power gives Nietzsche a means of overcoming Schopenhauer's pessimism. At the end, we will hope to have given you a comprehensive overview of one of the most difficult and misunderstood ideas in philosophy. If you want to be notified when parts 2 and 3 are released, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell button. With that said, let's get started. Schopenhauer and Darwinism Any comprehensive discussion on Nietzsche must begin with Schopenhauer. The logical place to start is Schopenhauer's idea of the will to life. As we will see, in many ways Nietzsche's will to power was formulated as a direct competitor to Schopenhauer's will to life. We will therefore briefly go over what this concept entails. For this section, we recommend you watch our series on Schopenhauer, particularly part 1, where we go in greater detail. For Schopenhauer, the will to life is the metaphysical basis for all of reality. Behind the facade of the phenomenal world, that is to say, the material world of time and space, the world of our senses and perception, is the world as will. This ever-striving, blind, irrational will is the true nature of reality. Our material world is simply an objectification of this will. Put another way, we are the end result of the workings of this will. We are the effects, and the will is the cause. What can we say about the will? Schopenhauer, at this point in his philosophy, takes a break from metaphysical speculation and takes a look at nature. He makes two observations. First, life is suffering. Second, everything that exists seems to fight for its own continued existence. And often, these two observations go hand in hand. This universal conflict becomes most distinctly visible in the animal kingdom. For animals have the whole of the vegetable kingdom for their food. And even within the animal kingdom, Every beast is the prey and the food of another, for each animal can only maintain its existence by the constant destruction of some other. Thus the will to live everywhere preys upon itself and in different forms is its own nourishment. So we arrive at three main ideas in Schopenhauer's conception of the will to life. 1. There is a metaphysical principle underpinning all of reality, the will. 2. This will is characterized by a struggle for life, or more broadly, a struggle for existence as its primary purpose. The will becomes the will to life. And 3. This struggle causes suffering. Pessimism. These three points will be important later on. Notice the phrase struggle for life in the second point. Besides Schopenhauer, the other major development we need to discuss before moving on to Nietzsche proper is Darwinism. 
We always have to remember that Schopenhauer wrote down his entire philosophy some 40 years before Darwin's monumental on the origin of species was published. It will take another few decades before Darwin's biological theory of evolution would make its influence known in other areas of human knowledge, such as philosophy. Nietzsche in particular writes during the heyday of the philosophical movement that sought to explain everything in the natural world, even human behavior, in terms of material causes and effects. This means, however, that there is no room for metaphysical principles such as the Schopenhauerian will. After all, metaphysics, literally meaning beyond physics, cannot exist in the materialist framework advanced by Darwin and his acolytes. The struggle for life, for Schopenhauer, is the result of a metaphysical will being divided against itself through an infinite number of objectifications of itself. The struggle for life, for Darwin, is the result of limited resources and natural selection. In discussing Nietzsche's will to power, one of the main points of contention is the following question. Is the will to power a metaphysical principle? Or is it a materialist explanation of behavior? Important follow-up questions include Does the will to power apply to all of reality? Or is it only limited to humans, animals or plants? As we shall see, to answer these questions is not straightforwardly simple. In fact, the answer to the questions seems to change throughout Nietzsche's own intellectual development. We will trace the development of the idea throughout Nietzsche's writings in the next part. We will see how Nietzsche's own understanding of the concept evolves, from how it appears in Das Spoke Zarathustra, all the way to the genealogy of morals and beyond good and evil. If you want to be notified when this part comes out, please subscribe to the channel and remember to click the bell button. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.